God and uh, welcome to our Good Friday communion service as we meet together as a congregation to reflect on the suffering that Jesus went through for our sake by sacrificing his life for our sins on the cross. It's great to have all of you uh, with us tonight. Just have a couple of announcements just before we begin the service. Uh, don't forget the dawn service on the mound this Easter Sunday morning at seven o'clock. As I said on Sunday, even though the clocks are going forward that hour, we're expecting a big crowd at the top of the mound. And as usual, the short service will be followed by breakfast in the church halls. And there will be an offering for the uh, Nakawanza project uh, at the breakfast. Then the prayer time in the library on Sunday morning at 20 to 11, followed by our Easter Sunday morning worship service at half 11, uh, which I hope to be speaking at. And uh, then finally, please don't feel that you have to rush away after the service is over, as uh, Maureen and Heather have organized tea and coffee to be served in the halls, and you'll all be made most welcome. So as we come to worship this evening, let's remind ourselves of Isaiah's prophecy about the suffering servant. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. We're going to stand now, and we're going to praise God in the words of what can wash away my sin. <laughs> Wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious. 
Now let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for those words that we've just been singing. We know that nothing can wash away our sin but the blood of Jesus. And we know that nothing can make us whole again. Nothing can cleanse our hearts. Only the blood of Jesus. And so, Father, as we bow in your presence this evening, we want to remember tonight on this special service the pain and the suffering of the cross. And, Father, we turn our thoughts to all that Jesus was willing to endure so that we might be set free from the power of sin and death. We know that he willingly paid the price and made such a great sacrifice to offer us the gift of everlasting life. He willingly shed his lifeblood. He willingly wore that crown of thorns, was kneeled to the cross, and suffered all sorts of verbal abuse and scorn, and died such a cruel death so that we might be forgiven. Sovereign Lord, help us never to take for granted this huge gift of love. Help us to be reminded of the cost of it all. Forgive us for being too busy or for being distracted by other things, but for not fully recognizing and responding to all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you that by the wounds of Christ we are healed. Thank you that because of his once and for all sacrifice, we can be cleansed and renewed, and though our sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. That through your only Son, sin and death have been conquered, and your power is eternal. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we praise you that you are making all things new. Bless us tonight with the presence of your spirit as we cast our minds for these moments to Calvary and as we focus on your amazing grace. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Bible reading this evening is found in John's Gospel, John chapter 19, and we're going to read from verse 16 through to verse 30. So John 19, and starting to read at verse 16 through to verse 30. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. So this is what the soldiers did. 
Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And we close there. I'm going to sing two more pieces. Uh, it was finished upon the cross. And Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice.
Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life, and I'm in that place once again. response if I was to ask your other half. Uh, I think if we're being honest with ourselves, our lives are filled with projects that we have never quite managed to complete. Uh, we possibly have half read books on our shelves, half eaten meals in the fridge or the freezer, and half finished laundry in the ironing basket. And some of us still have a pile of junk left from hobbies that we picked up for a while and then abandoned uh, half-built airfix model airplanes. Uh, Marianne uh, looks after Martha and Rory on a Wednesday. And every single Wednesday morning before Rory goes to nursery school at a quarter to 12, 
He always sticks his head into me in the study and he picks up this picture, this half-built Spitfire. And he says to me, Granda, can we finish building this aeroplane when I come home this afternoon? <laughs> now, this has been going on for a year and a half. And uh, you would think I would be shamed into actually finishing it. Uh, but half done homeworks, half done revision, half done housework, unfinished, incomplete, partially finished, imperfect. Uh, I think we've all been guilty at some point. But let me tell you something. Jesus most certainly did not leave the greatest project of his life unfinished. He finished it and he got the job done. He accomplished his mission, and as he came to the end of his life, Jesus received a drink of cheap wine, and he said, it is finished. It is finished. And then he died. But what did Jesus mean when he said, it is finished? Well, one thing that he meant was that he was through with his earthly suffering. And you don't need me to tell you that from the beginning, right from the very beginning of Jesus' life, right through to the end, Jesus lived a life of suffering. For the moment he left the heavenly palaces of light, to that moment when darkness descended upon him as he hung on the cross, Jesus suffered. In fact, in Philippians, Paul tells us that Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. We all know that he was born into a poor family in a smelly cave of a stable because there was no room for the family in the inn. His cot was a feeding trough, his pillow straw, his nursery mates, cows and donkeys, but all of that finished on the cross. And earlier on in John's Gospel, we read, Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. When he began preaching in his hometown, his neighbours threatened to stone him, and they drove him out of the town. Even his own brothers didn't believe what he was saying. And he became a homeless person, he became a wanderer, and there was nowhere for him to lay down his head. His miracles weren't always believed. His teachings weren't always obeyed. And his claims weren't always accepted. But again, all of that finished on the cross. Remember too the words of Isaiah? Jesus was despised and rejected by men. He was opposed by the priests and the politicians of his day. Shortly after his birth, Herod pursued him and his family, forcing them to become exiles and refugees in Egypt. The religious leaders tried to trap him with lies so that they could kill him. And even his closest friends betrayed him. Peter, the most loyal and true of his disciples, denied him not once, but as you all know, three times calling down curses from heaven to disown him. And Judas Iscariot, another of his closest friends and colleagues who had reclined with him at the table, greeted him with a kiss and betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. But that all finished at the cross too. And Jesus was a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. He was mocked by the soldiers and criminals who hung by his side. On that first Good Friday, they put a crown of thorns on his brow. They stripped him, they abused him, and they crucified him. And then they ridiculed and poked fun at him even more. He was thirsty. He was in agony. He was forsaken by his father. But all of that finished now. His earthly sufferings were over. But that's not all Jesus finished. 
If the only thing that Jesus finished on the cross was earthly suffering, well then, his life was nothing more than a tragic waste. And if that's all Jesus finished, then his death was no different to any other death. But folks, Jesus had something to show for his life and his death. His death wasn't just the end of his life. It was the accomplishment of his mission. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was announcing to the world that he had done his job. And that he had completed his task. And he had finished his project. What he had finished was suffering for sin. And the suffering of Jesus wasn't a tragic suffering. It was a saving suffering. Before Jesus died on the cross, humanity, you and me, was in bondage to sin. We were sold as slaves to sin. And we deserved to die in captivity. A price needed to be paid to redeem us, to buy us back from sin and death. But the price of redemption was a perfect sacrifice. A perfect sacrifice. A price that none of us could ever pay. So when Jesus cried out, it is finished, he was announcing that he was paying the price in full for us. Folks, Christ died for us, offering himself as a sinless sacrifice, buying back our freedom by paying sin's price. The word of Jesus spoke, it is finished, because those three words are actually just the one word in Greek was used by the Greeks for financial transactions. A sales clerk would write it on a sales receipt and what it meant was simply paid in full. It meant that the purchase had been made, that no debts were outstanding and that no further payments were required. (coughs) And finished is just the word to describe what Jesus did on the cross. For when Jesus died, he paid the full price for sin. His work of redeeming us from sin was perfect and was final. Jesus, I say it again, Jesus paid it all. He did it all, he finished all, he suffered all, and he made full atonement. And those of us who love Christ, those of us here this evening who have been washed and cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus, those of us who have been born again of the Spirit of God, have been purchased back from sin. We have no outstanding debts, And we don't need to make any further payments for our salvation. And you know, when Jesus said it is finished, he wasn't uttering a sigh of relief or a a, a moan of resignation. He was announcing and he was proclaiming victory. His cry was a cry of joy and triumph, a shout of jubilation and exaltation. His was a shout of a victor and a champion. I did it. I did it. That's what Jesus was crying. That's why he came. It was his mission. And it was his mission accomplished. But of course, there were one or two things Jesus still had to do. He had still to die. He had still to be buried. He had still to rise again. And he had still to ascend into heaven. And there's one more thing that he still has to do. And that is return to judge this world and take his people home to be with him forever. But when Jesus hung on the cross and said it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. His work was as good as done. He was finished paying the price for sin. And scripture tells us very clearly that Jesus didn't die until he was sure that he had accomplished his mission. John writes that Jesus bowed his head. And that's the kind of detail, that's the kind of detail that you get only from an eyewitness. Jesus bowed his head. And then John writes that Jesus gave up his spirit. You know, that phrase isn't used anywhere else in the Bible or anywhere else in Greek literature. 
It's only used here because only Jesus could give up his spirit. For every single one of us and for every single human being who has ever lived, death is inevitable. Humans, every single one of us, we are mortal. But folks, Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He is God as well as man. His death had to be voluntary. His death had to be a willing offering. Jesus' life wasn't taken from him. Jesus gave it up. The reason my Father loves me, Jesus said on another occasion, is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Be under no illusion, Jesus could have saved himself that day, but thank God he didn't. He chose to save us, he chose to save you and me instead. And folks, don't ever try to, to earn your salvation. Don't ever try to buy it. And don't try to complicate things by uh, adding things on. Plain and simply, Jesus, I say it again, Jesus paid it all. We can't, none of us, we can't refinish the finished work of Christ. Now, there are some things in life that improve when we add to them. For example, adding a couple of zeros to your paycheck at the end of the month. But some things are destroyed when we try to add to them. Just think about our human faces, for example. In, as I look down into the congregation here this evening, the beauty and the symmetry of those faces. Your face cannot be improved by the addition of a second nose onto the middle of your forehead or by the placement of a third ear onto your cheek. The human face is complete just the way it is. To add to it would be to disfigure it. And folks, the finished work of Jesus Christ is like that. To add to it is to disfigure it, to mar it, to destroy it altogether. There is nothing, nothing that we can contribute to the payment Jesus made on the cross for sin. There's no penance we can undergo. There's no good work we can perform. There's no pilgrimage we can embark on and no punishment we can endure to clear our guilt before God. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it is finished. He meant that he had completely paid the price to release his people from their bondage to sin. So for you and me to try to pay for our own sins is to deny that Jesus really did finish paying for sin. For you and me to try to do something to earn our salvation is really to make Christ out to be a liar. But let me bring things to a close. If you're sitting here this evening and you've never asked the Lord to let the sufferings and death of Jesus count for you, well then you have some unfinished business to take care of. Maybe to take care of here this evening. And let me say again, if you try to pay for your own sins, you'll never be finished making the payments. But if you come and you meet Jesus at the cross, you can be finished with the debt that you owe to God once and for all. All you need to do is tell God that you're truly sorry for your sins. You need to repent and you need to believe that Jesus died on the cross so your sins could be completely forgiven. And if you do that, then Jesus' mission will be accomplished in your life. And what he said on the cross will be true about the price he paid for your sins. It is finished. We sang the praise song earlier. How I love the voice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He declares his work is finished. He has spoken this hope to me. Though the sun had ceased its shining, 
though the war appeared as lost, Christ had triumphed over evil. It was finished upon the cross. Now the curse that has been broken, Jesus paid the price for me. Full the pardon he has offered, great the welcome that I receive. Boldly I approach my Father, clothed in Jesus' righteousness. There is no more guilt to carry. It was finished upon that cross. Let's pray. Father, thank you that through Christ's wounds we have been healed. And thank you that because of his costly sacrifice we have been freed from sin and death. Father, as we enter into this Easter weekend, let the fullness of Christ's finished work be realized in every single one of our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Folks, this is the, the Lord's table and our Saviour invites those who trust him to share the bread and wine this evening. If you're visiting with us tonight and you love the Lord, uh, you're invited to join us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together as a church family. Um, can I ask you to please leave your communion tokens in the pews and the elders will collect them at the close of the service. But we're going to stand now and we're going to sing once again those familiar words of When I Survey. <laughs> 